Greetings and blessings, you guys, and welcome to our online healing service. I am so glad that you all have joined us. As you know, today is March 1st, and we are entering into Women's History Month. And so we are really going to look at women's, women's issues, women's relationships with God, roles, and, and, and historical achievements, like all types of things that have to do with women this month. But of course, we will still uh, go back and address racism at some point because we're still uh, on that assignment to address racism in the United States. And we'll have some guests that we've invited to just share, you know, whatever God's put in their heart. And so throughout the month, we'll have all of that. But there will be a theme about women this month that'll be pretty consistent because it's actually very important for what God has called us to do. Um, I am Apostle Marquita Brooks. I'm the National Coordinator for the Imitation Movement. I'm also the founder and ministry leader of the Truth in the Spirit, which is the ministry that oversees the Imitation Movement. And I am excited to celebrate women, to look at, you know, really how God has designed women, what he's doing through women, and what we as a body of believers have to address, because we got a lot to address just in the body itself. And then, of course, also in the nation. As you guys know, we address women's issues and abortion and the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America. So, of course, we're going to go back and read some of that. We'll read some out of um, the family values section as well throughout this month because that very much affects women and the environments that young girls grow up in and, and the women they become. And so all these issues, of course, are interconnected. But I praise the Lord for the way he is starting us today. Hallelujah. I'm excited because Tanisha Press is going to do a report out, really a, a brief exhortation on the topic, Keepers of the Light, where the Lord is going to really just use her to share what we see throughout scripture, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and that real exhortation um, to, to, to carry the light of God forward. And of course, I'm going to talk about um, really being standard bearers. And so that's what we'll look at today and it's a good place for us to start because there's some very important roles that women play in our lives in the body of believers in the world um and so we really want to set that set that biblical standard and allow god to uh use us as we continue to go forward so let us pray and then lawrence and jasmine nichols are going to lead us in worship father we lift you up and we worship you lord god and we just praise you even now for leading guiding and directing us in accordance with your will we thank you, hallelujah, that you made man and woman in your image, but you've done very distinct and beautiful things in each one, just allowing us to be more and more like you, but also to be uniquely and distinctly ourselves. We bless you for your great grace, for your great ministry unto us, Lord God, and we invite you into this particular healing service and into everything that we're going to discuss this, this month. And we bless you that you speak to us and through us, Lord God, and help us to come together our male and female, slave and free, and from every ethnic background to really be your bride, the, the, the one that you've ordained us to be in the United States, but more specifically globally throughout the world, being the bride of Messiah. We bless you for that even now. We give you all the honor and the glory. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. So I'm going to turn it over to the Nichols so to lead us in worship.
is so so important because when we really really connect with the lord when we really worship him when we really honor him it becomes very clear that we should honor women we should honor our mothers the role of women becomes very clear in the presence of the lord so when we come out of that place that it becomes confusing and even believers are not sure 
the role the women to play and how women ought to be treated. But I want to encourage you that as we come closer and closer to him, the Lord answers all of these questions. And he puts all things in order and in the right position. And so with that, I praise God. I'm going to turn it over to Tanisha, who's going to share a brief exhortation with us on the topic, Keepers of the Light. Shalom, everybody. So God is really calling um, women, women to be keepers of the light, to help prepare the way for his return and to usher in the spirit of the Lord in both yourself, in your home, in your family, your community, and your nation. And when we take a look at scripture, there are notable women who were keepers of the light, who really prepared the way for the Lord. And some were even called prophets. So the example of women prophets in the Tanakh were Miriam in Exodus 15, 20, Deborah, Judges 4, 4, 4 Huldah, 2 Ken, Kings 22, 14, and 2 Chronicles 34, 22, Nadiah, Nehemiah 6, 14, and the woman prophet Isaiah 8, 3. And so there were also some examples of women prophets in the Messianic writings as well. We have Anna, the prophet in the temple in Luke 2.36, and also Philip's daughters described as virgins who prophesied in Acts 21.9. However, in the book of Revelation, specifically in the letter to Thyatira, Revelation 2.18-29, Yeshua rebukes a woman who calls herself a prophet for teaching and deceiving my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. It's verse 20. So this woman is clearly a leader in the Messianic community, but is she a genuine prophet? Is she a woman who is truly hearing the voice of the Lord? Is she submitted to God? Is she being used as God's mouthpiece? Is she an independent witness of the Lord? Now, the prophet Jeremiah testifies that personal holiness and purity is a test for a true prophet. You can find that in Jeremiah 23, 9 through 40. I encourage you to read all of Jeremiah 23. But I'm just going to pick out some of the parts of that. So what do false prophets do? Verse 10, the prophets follow an evil course and they use their power unjustly. So we know God is good. There's no evil in him. He's just. So clearly, if these people are saying that they're prophesying under the name of the Lord, they're not because they're using an evil course and they're, they're using their power unjustly. So they're not abiding in him and he's not abiding in them. Um, verse 11, both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. So they don't recognize or even obey God. Even in the very house of the Lord, in his sight, they're profane and in doing disgusting acts that are taking place there. Verses 13 and 14. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not their God because here they're listening to Baal. They're being um, influenced by demonic influence. And they're not remaining faithful to the covenant in their actions and their hypocrites, really. Um, there's a, a really powerful example in Isaiah 65, 3 through 5, where he talks about hypocrites here. So a person, this is the Lord speaking here, actually. A people who continually provoke me to my very face offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pig and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away from me, don't come near me, for I am too holy for you. Such people are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. So it's really, to be a hypocrite is to be offensive to God, right? So here we have some people who they're not returning, they're not turning to God, and they're not causing anyone else to actually repent. And in fact, they're emboldening the hands of the evildoer. And so ultimately they're not keeping the standards of God and they're not encouraging others to do it as well. The prophet says in um, Jeremiah 23 verse 16, do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hope. They speak visions from their own minds, saying peace when there is no peace. So why is there no peace? Why is there no shalom? Well, shalom comes from the very countenance, the face of God. 
But when a people, a nation go astray and they don't repent because God is holy and he only can dwell among that holy people, he turns his face. And so there's a natural consequence of our sin then go into effect. And so further on, it goes on that these false prophets, they haven't stood in the council of the Lord to see and actually to hear his word. And they're leading people astray with lies and they don't call the people to repentance. The master himself, Yeshua, in Matthew 7, 15, 23, tells us that we will know a true prophet by the fruit that they bear. And so we have like a little checklist here. Does the prophecy come to pass? If it doesn't, that person was not speaking the word of the Lord. So if a prophet claims to, to be speaking in the name of the Lord and what they say doesn't take place or come true, that message um, is the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, presumptuously do not be alarmed. That's Deuteronomy 18, 22. If the prophecy doesn't line up with the word and the character of God, again, not from God. If the prophecy doesn't point you to God or doesn't lead you to repentance, it's not from God. And if it's not exhibiting the fruit of the spirit, not speaking on behalf of the Lord. So a true person, again, they're gonna speak, true prophet will speak the word of the Lord um, he's going he's gonna to lead his people into righteousness. They're always going to point the person back to God, give all the glory to God. And their personal life and their fruit matches up with the clear standards of God according to his word. So the character and behavior of the woman of Thyteria did not meet the biblical standard, the test for a true prophet. And Yeshua doesn't rebuke her for being a leader, but rather for being an immoral one. So... Um, She's really prophesying out of the spirit of Jezebel, right? And that's just a stench in the nostrils of God. And so we are called to have a clear difference about us. The Lord is calling us to operate in his spirit. So I have a few key bullet points here for that. Number one, you're going to communicate the will of the Father to the people. So we're only going to speak the word of God. That's John 12, 49, Yeshua prophet with a capital P is speaking here it says for I have not spoken on my own initiative but the father who sent me has given me a command namely what to say and how to say it so Yeshua only did and only said what he saw the father do and saying and that's the same thing that we should be doing as well but how do we do that one you got to stand in his counsel daily Jeremiah 23 18 again pray without ceasing here you have to allow the Lord to speak to you pause from all of your talking, right? Take this, listen to the Lord, sometimes even taking dictation so that he can speak to us and then speak through us at the appointed time. You need to know the word of God because God's spirit, unfortunately, isn't the only spirit speaking. So we have to be like the Brian Jews who were of noble character. And when they received the message, they did so with eagerness, but they also examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was actually true. That's Acts 17, 11. So we have to really become one with the word, eat the scroll like in Ezekiel 3, so that we speak nothing contrary to God's word. Because the words that we speak cannot, can, can actually uh, give life or death, right? So we want to have words that strengthen and edify, that instruct or improve or correct someone in love according to God's character. It's also important that we are humble, that we have to understand that we are dark without his light. We can go back to Genesis 1, right? So when God created the heavens and earth, there was chaos, waves, darkness, over the surface of the deep, but God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. And then John 1 parallels Genesis 1. It says that the word was God himself, and we were made in and through him. So Yeshua is the light. He is the life and the light of men, John 1, 4. And so when we're humble, and we know that we don't have any light beyond the light that he has, then we can stay in a constant fear of the Lord and a submission to him as well. And so we only reflect his light into this dark world. It says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not understand it, but the darkness can't overpower it either. That's John 1, 5. And so what is this darkness, right? It's the sinful path. It's the dark path. 
Proverbs 2, 13 through 14. It says, these men turn from the right way to walk down dark paths. They take pleasure in doing wrong and they enjoy twisted ways of evil. So it's the current mindset of this age. It's the rebellion to the ways of God. The Romans 12, 2 says, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of this current world, Olay Hosam. Instead, keep letting yourself be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. We see a, a good example of the transforming of your mind, I would say, in John 10, 22 through 42. So Yeshua is in the temple during the Feast of Dedication, where he explains that he is the shamash, or the helper, the servant candle, that middle candle in the Hanukkah. And we're the surrounding candles around him. And we're dark until he ignites us, right? He's the light. So when he, the candle touches our, our wick, then we're conformed to the image of the son who is light, right? That's eight, Romans 8, 29, right? When we're conformed to the image of the son. And he's the good shepherd, so he laid down his life for us. That he, so we're able to do that. He's able to do that through us, John 10, 1 through 21. And so we are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14 through 16, because we're reflecting his light. And then that way we let our light shine among men. And so we really just testify of the light, just as John the Immerser, John the Baptist, um, did, who came in the spirit of Elijah, was a witness, a testimony of the light. So are we that, so that others might believe in Yeshua through our testimony, right? We are also like John, we're not the light, but we testify of the light. And so the next point is that we need to prepare the way for Yeshua's return. We really want to operate in the spirit and the power of Elijah, which turns the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers and the disobedient to the wisdom to the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That's Luke 1, 17. So the spirit of Elijah prepares the way through the ministry of reconciliation and relationship to God in the home between the community, brethren, and ultimately between the Jew and the Gentile. So behold, I send to you, Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the father. At least I come and strike the lamb with decree of utter destruction. That's Malachi 4, 5 through 6. So we know that in Isaiah 59, 16, God is looking for an intercessor, right? An intercessor who will stand in the gap between God, the people, and judgment. But we are the chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who's called us out of this darkness and into this wonderful light. And that's 1 Peter 2, 9. So the purpose of us is to be really in our priestly role, declaring his praises, offering biblical prayers, and right sacrifices unto God. I'm going to encourage you to go to burntofferings.org for more for that. We also need to be right judges. So we don't judge people, but really we're the protectors of the will of the Father. We have the word of God, which is the will of the Father, revealed in the perfection of Yeshua. We have the Holy Spirit acting as a guide, and we even have the Declaration of Kingdom Standards. And so that's why it's important that we use these tools to help us make correct, correct judgments. Psalms 82 says that God or Elohim stands or takes his stands in his congregation, confronts the Elohim that's with the little e, and demands justice from the Elohim. So there's a court in heaven with God the creator as judge, and he demands that we use the authority that he's given us properly to make correct judgments in the land. It says that righteousness and judgment, justice are the foundation of God's throne steadfast love and faithfulness go before him. That's Psalms 89, 14. So God is just, he's steadfast, he's love, he's faithful. That's the core and the essence of who he is. And he expects us to be the same if we're abiding in him and he's abiding in us. In Deuteronomy 16, 20, the Lord actually commands that it's justice and only justice that you shall follow to live and inherit the land that the Lord God has given you. Deuteronomy 27, 19 says that we're cursed if we pervert justice. So we really have to learn to do good, seek justice, 
corrects op oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause in Isaiah 117. And also, I'm going to encourage you to go to the Declaration of Kingdom Standards at invitationnvmt.org. So I'm going to take you now to the book of Acts chapter 15. We have some Gentiles coming into the fold to a predominantly Jewish movement. Um, and some false doctrine is being spread that salvation is really based upon works. And so the Jewish apostles and the elders come together in a council to discuss what to do about these Gentiles who are coming into the faith. So clearly God's working through them. He's called them by name, but they really don't have a good understanding of the covenant. And it's easy when you don't understand the covenant that you're grafted into to be led astray. And so they didn't want to overburden the new believers with more than they could handle at one time. So the biblical solution to this was and still is today can be found in Acts 15. So as God purifies your heart, as we come together in community with Jewish and Gentile believers alike, as we hear and learn the law of Moses preached in synagogues every Shabbat, we would then come into a greater understanding and obedience to Torah, keeping in mind that the New Testament is still hundreds of years in the future, right? So as we grow in the knowledge of the Lord, um, but in the meantime, the apostles were saying, we're going to send you Jewish leadership. Um, and we're going to help you guide you there, but we want you to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood and from meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. That's Acts 15, 29. So then when we look at the Messianic congregation in Thyteria, right? It's a wealthy town in the northern part of Lydia, Rome, um, a province of Asia, mostly in a Gentile population with some Jews. So what does that kind of sound like today? Sounds like the church, really, not grafted into the rooted olive, tr olive tree of Israel. And so when that happens, apostasy sets in. We start to drift further and further away from the commands of the Lord. So we have this false prophet rebuked by Yeshua, for teaching and deceiving his servants, leading them astray with sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. And so um, when, I, when I really thought about what does uh, sexual immorality or eating food sacrificed to idol look like today, you know, kind of was just talking to the Lord about it. Of course, some of it is obvious, right? But some of it may not be so obvious, you know, eating food sacrificed to idols. It's what you're ingesting into your body, right? So what what um, doesn't come from the Lord that's really, that's just not good for you and is going to produce uh, some bad ends for you. So we have here violence, right? A temper, lack of self-control, an unbridled tongue, which can destroy and curse. Too much entertainment. Some people are obsessed with like Netflix and streaming and news and social media, partying and, and just all folly. Proverbs 14 says that folly is a, decep a deception. Profanity, again, an unbridled tongue, being a glutton or a drunken. You really just become a food, a slave to food or alcohol or tobacco products. The love of money, the root of all evil, the love of luxury and excess, not breaking our covenant with Babylon. Um, over fascination with athletic events or witchcraft, got to check your horoscope every day or even prophesying unsubmitted to God. Technology, got to have the latest devices, spending all your money on that. Pursuing personal gain and accolades. Thrill seeking, worshiping of self and loved ones, including your own children. Lust and perversions, worship of health, fitness and wellness. Nothing wrong with exercise and proper diet. The Lord wants us to be you know, fit for his temple, for his spirit, um, but we can't worship wellness itself. And then cross-dressing gender confusion. So God created us male and female, but he's not the author of confusion, right? Satan is. So if there's any confusion there, you seek the Lord for that. Um, and an unforgiving heart. We want to be cleansed of unforgiveness because unforgiveness is a sin. And it's a stumbling block to us and to others. And really, these are all the works of the flesh, and not the fruit of the spirit, according to Galatians 5, 19 through 26. So we're called out of the darkness into his light. And we have to be a house that reflects his light. And we can't be practicing and participating in any kind of immorality, right? We have to repent and turn back to God. 
So I'm going to also point you back to burntofferings.org for more on that, to allow the Lord to really witness to your spirit so that you can be delivered from some things that you feel that you may need to be. Um, so I do want to read just part of a scripture, Psalms 68. It says, the Lord announces the word, and the women who proclaim it are a mighty throng or a mighty presence or group. Psalm 68, 24 through 26 continues on. It says, your procession, God, has come into view, the procession of my God and the king into the sanctuary. In front of the singers, after them are the musicians, and then, and then the young women playing the timbrels. Praise God in the congregation. Praise the Lord in the assembly of Israel. So I really want to encourage you that if we get this right, that women who have submitted their vessel to the Lord, who have really dedicated themselves to him, will be leading the procession for Messiah's victorious return as he takes his seat on the throne. That's very exciting to me. So amen. Thank you. That's what the Lord gave me. <laughs> amen. Thank you. I, I always appreciate your exhortations and your report out. Um, such a tremendous blessing. And this is a great place for us to start. Um, women as keepers of the light. Um, many of you guys observe Shabbat as we do, and uh, the Shabbat tradition, which comes, you know, um, out of Israel's history, is that when the candles are lit, not just on Shabbat, but even on some biblical feasts, like on Passover, if you guys join us for our Passover Seder, you'll see that I'll be doing it as well, and, and it always happens in the household, but when the lights, when the candles are lit, two candles on Shabbat or two candles on Passover, when the candles are lit, it's the woman who lights the candles. And it's the woman who says the, says the blessing over the candles. Because um, Jews believe that women are the, the, the keepers of the light of the house. Women invite the light into the house. Um, and it goes specifically back to scripture. And we're going to talk about that today, what that even means. But uh, what that really lets us know is that there's a very important role that women play. And so the tradition of women being the light keepers that... that um, Jewish mindset. It comes straight out of what we see happening in Genesis chapter 3, where the enemy, of course, he comes to the woman. The serpent comes to the woman. And he comes to the woman to deceive her and tempt her. And so she's the first out of the, the couple, the man and the woman, she's the first out of the couple to sin. Now, this is important because what Jews believe is that as the light left through the woman first, the light is reintroduced. The light is brought back through the woman into the household. Now, this is a very important thing for us to realize because what you see is that the serpent picked the woman. It says that he was more crafty than any of the other animals. And of course, we know this serpent is, is really possessed by Satan. Why would Satan pick the woman? Why, as he's looking at this couple, does he go, oh, there's the one I need to go to? Well, Men often preach, well, it's because the woman was the, the weaker sex. But if that was the case, it would have stopped with her. You see what I mean? She'd have been tempted. That would have been the end of that. <laughs> it was about the fact that she was weak. It's not why the serpent picked her. The serpent picked her because women are designed by God to be influencers. Women don't have the physical stature to, to lead by brute force or by strength. And because we know that, we've always known that from, from our you know, very inception, women from early on, you'll see little, 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 little girls learning to be influencers, not forcing things, not leading by strength, but influencing. This is how women tend to lead is by influencing. And people say like the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Because the reality is any man that's in power, the woman in his life is the influencer. She's the main influencer. Behind every good man is a good woman. She's the influencer. Um, whenever there was a king on the throne, there was the queen mother. She had been queen before with his father. Now her son is king. Who is his first counsel? The queen mother. She's the influencer. She's the hand that rocks the cradle. And, and it's important that we get that because it is the design of a woman to be an influencer, which comes from our, our nature to nurture and comfort. The fact that we nurture and comfort puts us automatically in the position of influencer, automatically. 
And, and so the enemy has always seen that, and that has always made him afraid. Additionally, he's very much concerned about the fact that women bear life within our own bodies. The Lord puts a seed in a woman, or you know, the, the man plants the seed, of course, but it's the Lord that allows that process to happen. He then blesses that seed. It grows in the woman, a woman births life. And the fact that the woman is used by God to continue to birth humans, those about whom the enemy is very jealous, <laughs> it, it, she becomes an object of concern for Satan. Women are an object of concern. And so he sees, okay, of these two people, the man and the woman, the woman is the influencer. So if I can convince her in her mind, see, he doesn't use brute strength. He doesn't try to push her into it. He influences her. Why? So that she can influence the man. Now, notice this. This is not the first encounter that the serpent has with woman. And I know you're like, what? How is that possible? I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. I want to take you to Revelation chapter 12. We see a sign in the heaven. There's a woman clothed with the sun and under her feet is the moon and on her head is a crown of 12 stars. Now, Rabbi Eric Carlson did an amazing teaching about this during Ecclesia on Saturday. If you missed it, please go back and watch that. Watch that because what I'm about to say is going to make a whole lot more sense when you hear his teaching, which I can't even try to duplicate. I can't duplicate it because he's amazing at it. <laughs> but this is specifically talking about stars, constellations in the heavens. So when Rabbi Carlson teaches about this on Saturday, and this is not the first Ecclesia that he's taught this in. He's taught it in previous Ecclesias, but when he said it on Saturday, he did it, did so with, with reference to the return of our Messiah, the millennial reign of Messiah. So it was the context wherein he shared it was just powerful. So go back and please listen to his teaching. You want to listen to all four of them. But I'm making reference to Rabbi Carlson's right now. So you see this woman in the constellation of the heavens, Rabbi Carlson reveals to us that that is the constellation of Virgo. And he talks about the fact that the constellation of Virgo, and this is not for horoscopes, and you should just talk to us about that, being witchcraft. It's not about astrology. This is not about trying to figure out, you know, when is a good time for me to try to get a date. No, this is about the Lord using what he put in the heavens to share some truth with us. And that's just us listening to God. That's not us looking at the heavens apart from God. Make sure you understand that. That's why you got to listen to Rabbi Carlson's message. So anyway, we got this constellation of Virgo, which is a maiden shaped out by stars with 12 stars around her head. Now, it's important that we get that because she got the moon at her feet. She got the 12 stars around her, her head. Now, we understand that, that the Lord created the sun, the moon, and the stars before he created men. Okay, we see that in Genesis chapter one. So these constellations and the moon and the, and, and the sun exist before humans walk the earth. All right. So we see this sign in the heavens. It doesn't say it's a, it's a physical woman. It says it's a sign in the heavens. But this sign in the heavens, there's another sign where there's a great dragon, with seven heads, 10 horns and seven crowns. And he sweeps a third of the stars out of the, out of the heavens. Now we know that was a third of the angels that he had now brought into his side because he's about to, 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 to incite a coup in the heavenly realms. He's about to try to overthrow God in heaven, okay? So now look what happens. This woman who is a sign in the heavens, she's not a physical person, okay? She's a sign in the heavens. She gives birth to a son, a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. That's Messiah. So clearly this constellation is a, is a symbol in the heavens that Messiah is coming and Messiah will be birthed through a woman, okay? So this sign exists even as Satan is trying to do his coup in the heavenly realms. Now watch this. The, 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 the child is snatched up, taken to the throne of God. The woman goes into the desert and, and look at verse seven. It says next. Or in other versions, it says then. This is showing us chronology, order. Now, the reason that's important is because a lot of things in the book of Revelation are not in order. There's this prophecy, then that prophecy, then that prophecy. They're not all in order. But when you see next and then, that means this came after that. You understand what I mean? We, we, we see an order there because of the words. 
So the next thing is that there's a battle in heaven. Satan is fighting the, the good angels, the ones that did not become a part of his coup to try to th take over the throne of God. Of course, he loses and he's thrown down to earth. Now, let us get an understanding of what is happening here. Before humans walk the earth, Satan has gotten a clue that a woman is coming and she's going to bear a son and that son is going to rule. He's He's got a picture of this because the, the son already exists. See, when you go back to Genesis chapter one, what you're going to see when God creates, and, and Rabbi Carlson talks about this, I'm telling y'all, y'all got to go back and listen to it because his, I can't even really do justice to his teaching, but I want to show y'all something real quick to understand about the woman, okay? So you see that, that here on this fourth day in verses 14 through 19, we see the Lord creating lights in the dome of the sky to divide the day from the night for signs, seasons, days, and years. And, and, and Rabbi Carson lets us know that that word seasons is Moedim, which are the, the, the divine seasons and timing of God. These are God's feast, his cycles, his timeline, okay? So we see that these lights are put in the sky. We see the, the two great lights, and then we see also the stars. So we get the sun, the moon, and the stars. They go into the heavens on the fourth day. Humans don't come till the sixth day. So this sign appears when God creates the heavens. And the enemy responds and goes, you about to make what? You about to make what? A woman who's going to have a son and he's going to rule what? I should be ruling. No way. This is not okay with me. And it's the fact that he realizes that a woman is coming who will bear a son who will rule that causes him to go off and to throw a hissy fit and to, to establish a coup in the heavenly realm. Before he even lays eyes on a human, he knows something is coming because he can read the signs. The Lord has already established. See, he, the Lord takes some things from eternity and thrusts them into the beautiful artwork that he put in the sky so that signs are there for what's to come and the enemy can read those. And he goes, wait a minute, stop this. This is showing a woman, a son, he's going to rule. No, no, no. I should be the one ruling. No, no, no. In fact, because you're making this horrible decision here, I got to get rid of you. And he tries to get rid of God. So now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. This serpent who's possessed by Satan has seen a sign. The woman is going to give birth to a son. Uh-oh, let me mess her up. I got to get her off track because she's going to give birth to a son. But look at what happens when the, the Lord pronounces the judgments. Okay, look at what happens when the Lord pronounces the judgments. To the serpent, he says in verse 15, I will put animosity between you and the woman and between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. In other versions say he will crush your head. And you will strike his heel. So in that curse, the Lord is letting Satan know you didn't win anything. That son is still coming and he's going to crush your head. You might have caused some problems, maybe a little delay, but you didn't change my sign in the heaven. My sign is still coming to pass. It's going to happen. And this is so key that we understand that because we see the enemy pursuing women continually throughout history. The enemy pursues women, but now he's got a little weapon in his disposal. Let's look at what, what is said to the woman. I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth because that's part of her purpose is to birth life. So now in order to, to fulfill her purpose, she has greatly increased pain. There was always going to be a stretching. There was always going to be a discomfort in childbirth, but now it's increased pain that sometimes even leads to death, okay? And that wasn't a part of the original perfect plan. But now that's a part, the purpose itself now has a curse attached to it. Now look, watch this. And you will bring forth children in pain. Your desire will be toward your husband and he will rule over you. Now the enemy goes, ha, 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 ha. I got a way to keep her down. 
God just said that the husband's going to rule over her. So now I got to influence him to misuse his leadership so she can stay under his thumb so that she can never completely fulfill her purpose. Now, I need y'all to understand how all of this is playing out. Because when that son comes, the one who was prophesied by the, in, the, in the heavens, in, 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 in Revelation chapter 12, he removes the curse. He removes every curse. In which case, the fact that a woman's affection is for her husband almost unto idolatry, that curse is broken. And the fact that the man rules over her almost unto oppression, that curse is broken. Yeshua then restores the beautiful roles where the man speaks identity into things and a woman nurtures and is the helpmate at his side. Now, these roles, believe me, I'm going to talk a whole lot more about them this month. But tonight, I need you to understand why it's so important that the woman bears the standard. Tanisha already told us about her keeping the light. So the, the woman was not a good steward of the light in Genesis chapter three. She allowed herself to be influenced. And in one of her most important roles, which I actually speak about this in our prophetic training level one, the very first tra training, I speak about the fact that one of the woman's most important roles is to represent her husband well. Now, as the bride of Messiah, we got to get that. We got to get that. Because the bride has to represent her husband well. We see that she does him good and not harm all the days of his life. And, and, and we see that Proverbs 31 woman, that her husband is well respected at the gate. Why? Because everything she does represents him well. She is a helper suitable to that man. And if they have problem or issues, nobody else knows about it, it's handled behind closed doors. Because when they come forward, they are united front. She is standing by him. She is a helper suitable and no one is able to get in between them because if someone can get in between them, we go back to Genesis chapter three. She is influenced and then she influences him and there's all types of disorder. That's where we see the introduction of a Jezebel spirit. Why would the enemy want to use a woman in the Jezebel spirit? We always see it personified as a woman. In fact, Jezebel, after whom it is named, of course, was Ahab's wife. She is a queen who her father served Baal. And literally everything we see causing Israel to fall apart after that came straight out of her. Directly from that Baal worship that she brought to first to Ahab, influencing him, and then to the northern kingdom. And then it spilled over into the southern kingdom. And all types of trouble come from this one woman. Why? Because she was an influencer. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So this is why the enemy would like to take a woman Fill her with a Jezebel spirit because she's designed to influence. You see what I mean? And, and it's not, like I said, it's, it's more subtle than a man. See, a man is going to lead out front directives, force, not a woman. You may not even see her, but she may still be leading through influence. And you may never know that she's the reason all these things have occurred but she may be. This is why Tanisha said that the, the true prophets, they use their, 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 their gift for good rather than evil. In most households, we see the husband operating in a, in a pastoral capacity oftentimes, sometimes in an apostolic capacity, but guess what capacity the wife tends to operate in? The role of the prophet. She is speaking into the ear of the leader and pointing direction for him. That's what a prophet does. The prophet, more than anything, see, I see prophets all the time trying to have big audiences and speaking to all the people. That's not even the prophet's job mainly. The, the prophet's main job is to speak to the leader. That's the prophet's main job is to speak into the leader. And when the prophet gets that right, rightly influencing the leader, then the leader is going to rightly influence the people. This is why I say, most wives tend to operate as their husband's prophet. She's speaking into his ear. And a lot of men are waiting to hear what she's going to say. And they may not even tell people that's what they do. But there are business decisions made. There are political decisions made, national decisions made, all type of decisions made in the bedroom. Nobody even knows that woman is the influencer. But he says, I'll come back and tell you my decision later. Why? Because he's going to talk to his wife. 
He's going to hear what she has to say and then come forward with a decision. And most times people don't even know she has help to make. Now, this is important that we understand that. It's important because that has always been true throughout history. Even when women were oppressed, that was always true throughout history. We just came out of Purim. Who influenced Haman to build that huge gallows? Come on, y'all. <laughs> the whole the whole time he's going back talking to his wife and she's egging him on right up until the time that his downfall comes and she goes oh man because it came through a Jew I don't see how you're going to get out of this he's been listening to her this whole time <laughs> now all of a sudden she want to prophesy doom <laughs> it's important that we see because this has always been true in history y'all this has always been true in history now, the reason I say this is important because a woman has to realize she must bear the standard. When, when, when you know, I do a lot of premarital counseling for people, you know, or, and sometimes even marital counseling. And, 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 and we talk about holiness with regard to couples that are engaged, they're courting, they're planning to, to go into marriage. Let me tell you whose responsibility it is to make sure that they don't fornicate before marriage. It's not the man. Because he's going to do whatever the woman allows him to do. It's the woman. She has to set that standard. She has to be at a place of strength and self-control to be able to set that standard. This is why the Bible makes such references that we see in Proverbs. Like in Proverbs chapter 9, we see that woman folly who's loud, undisciplined, unruly. And she's calling and beckoning people in. But there's also the woman wisdom. And we see that woman is really likened unto the Holy Spirit. And, and this is so important. I'll share my testimony with you guys uh, in the future. But we see the woman as, as, as both male and female were made in the image of God. You see that in Genesis chapter 1. I actually want to read it in your hearing because most times people don't get it right. But in Genesis chapter 1, what it tells us here, it says in verse 27, So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, when we get that, we realize that that the that God himself, Yahweh, which means I am, is everything. But there's aspects of his nature that are found in man, and there's aspects of his nature that are found in man with the womb, the <laughs> womb man. And the aspects that are in the woman are likened much unto the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, who is the nurturer, who is gently guiding into all truth. But what else does the Holy Spirit do? Only speak what the Father speaks. See, so what is the Holy Spirit doing? Fulfilling that role rightly. Remember as I told you, wives are supposed to do? Fulfilling that role rightly. And so when a woman is fulfilling it rightly, the truth is she's going to be likened unto the Holy Spirit in her home. But when a woman is not fulfilling it rightly, she is going to be a Jezebel spirit in her home, her community, and her society. Because regardless, her design is to influence. Her design is to raise up. So what are women raising up in this nation? The challenge is a woman herself has to be raised up rightly so that then she can raise up rightly. But our women are abused, persecuted, oppressed, so pressed, uh, neglected, abandoned, so that the young women don't have the security that they need to protect their own virtue, to grow up in a safe environment, to realize how valuable they are so that they then close the door to the enemy. Don't accept the perversion that he wants to send, the perversion of purpose and the Jezebel spirit to pervert influence. See, when a woman is, is raised up in security, she will reject it and she will bear the standard in her household and in her community. But when she is not, when she's left to defend herself, when she is, is out there on her own, she's going to use her influence to protect herself. And she'll learn very early on that she can get men to do what she wants them to do if she does certain things. Now the door is open for per perversion and witchcraft. But this happens to our young women who don't have the protection, the covering of their fathers in order to grow up in a holy way the way that God has called them to. Now, we got a lot more to talk about. I didn't even get to the Declaration of Kingdom Standards for the United States of America, but we actually address many of these issues in issue two, women's issues and in, in, in abortion, and in issue three, family values and gay rights, because women are essential in all of that. But I want to encourage you to remember this. Satan 
hates humanity, but he often targets the woman. In any culture or society, including our faith, if Satan can suppress or oppress the women, then the standard is going to be tainted. The standard will be perverted. He knows it because women are the standard bearers. Women set the atmosphere in the home. Women set the standard with the men setting white boundaries. Because a man, once he finds that woman, he's going to go after her. Whatever rules she set, he's going to follow them. Because that's the one. You see what I mean? And, and Satan knows this. So when he can oppress or suppress a woman, then the standard goes away. The standard is no longer clear. I'm going to give y'all one last story and then we're going to pray. But keep this in mind. Years ago, the Lord, he always sends me to do strategic intercession when I go to Israel. But on one of my earliest trips, it might have been the first one, he had me go into Jordan. And Jordan borders on Saudi Arabia. And they took me to the border of Saudi Arabia. I'm in Jordan. And I'm at the border of Saudi Arabia. And I'm standing on a mountain. And I began to pray. Because the Lord told me to pray into Saudi Arabia. Because I'm right there at the border on this mountain in Jordan, praying over Saudi Arabia. And you know what he had me to proclaim? He had me to proclaim that the mothers will wake up. See, Islam was birthed in Saudi Arabia. That's where Islam comes from. It came right out of Saudi Arabia. And as I began to proclaim that the mothers will wake up, the Lord said that they would no longer be oppressed or suppressed, that they would receive his Holy Spirit. Because when the mothers woke up, they will fulfill their nurturing and protect, protecting job of their children and would no longer allow their children to be raised up to become terrorists. See, if you can suppress a woman, you can do whatever you want to do to her babies. Come on now. But if a woman is in her right role, try to touch her babies if you want to. Just try Think you're going to put her baby on the front line with a machine gun? Try it. It's not going to work. But if you take the women out of their position, you, you start to disarm them from early on. They won't actually stand in the role they're supposed to stand, the role we're designed to stand in for the babies. And now you've got the whole future generation. Because she is the one that's raising the children. And if you see how powerful that is, you'll also realize why even in Christianity, even in Judaism, women have often been suppressed and oppressed, misused scriptures, misapplied. But this month, we're going to address those scriptures. And we're going to rightly apply the word of truth so that the Holy Spirit can be at work and women can fulfill the role we were designed to fulfill. So I'm going to tell you, just watch this example. Any ministry where you've ever seen women were oppressed, they can't preach, can't teach, can't talk, nah, 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 nah. gotta wear this, gotta do that. Any ministry where you've ever, ever, ever seen that, I guarantee you there's no flow of the Holy Spirit. Oppress women, and you offend the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be driven out, and that's exactly what the enemy, the enemy wants. You know why? Because he's gonna bring a contrary spirit. And I'm telling you, if you've ever seen women oppressed in ministry, you also do not see the Holy Spirit. Pay attention. Think about the history, the ministries you know. It's a trend because women are designed, likened unto the Holy Spirit. So we got to pray. That God get this thing back in, in the right position. No Jezebels, but also no oppression or suppression of women. But women rightly operating in that narrow path of, of, of positively influencing unto holiness, unto righteousness, and the role that we have been ordained to fulfill. Let us pray. Hallelujah, Father. We just thank you for, for truth. Hallelujah. For deliverance and for empowerment because you are well able to do it. The, the Bible itself it empowers, it affirms women. You make all things clear when we come directly to you. But when our hearts are stubborn, when we have decided that we already know the truth, then it is hidden from us. We ask even now, Lord God, this prayer, not just for women in your kingdom, but for men as well, because it takes all of us to raise godly women and godly children and have a godly society. Lord, we thank you that you open all of our hearts and minds to your truth about 
women. We thank you, hallelujah, Lord God, that you challenge our doctrine, that we would see beautiful things in your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that you continually transform us by the renewing of our minds so we will know what you want, particularly concerning women. And we will agree that what you want is good, satisfying, and able to succeed for everyone. We thank you, Father, that you remove the spirit of competition between men and women. We thank you that you break the curse of oppression between men and women in the name of Yeshua. We thank you that you bind up the Jezebel spirit in Yeshua's name and you release your Holy Spirit, Lord God, in a holy fire for women to be light keepers and standard bearers in our homes, in our communities, and in our nation. We bless you for it and we thank you for doing it even now in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now I want to release the ironic blessing unto all of you because the truth is, we got to do this thing together. Yivorekaka, Yahweh, Eishmoreka, Yae, Yahweh, Pana, Eleka, Vehoneka, Isa, Yahweh. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh look upon you and give you his shalom and give you his shalom. In Yeshua Hamashiach, in Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. You guys be blessed, and I'm excited to see you again as we continue on this much-needed topic. See you soon. <laughs>